So now I'd like to introduce uh, the moderator for the next panel, um, Joan Borsa. Joan is a Canadian curator, critic, interdisciplinary scholar, and associate professor of art and art history, as well as women's and gender studies at the University of Saskatchewan. Her work focuses on museum, gallery, and curatorial studies, socially engaged art projects, feminist art practices, the particularities of place and situated knowledge. Her writing integrates discussions of contemporary art and culture with everyday lived experience, social history, theoretical perspectives, and storytelling. Borsa received the Saskatchewan Lieutenant Governor's Lifetime Achievement Award in 2009, and the Saskatoon YWCA Women of Distinction Lifetime Achievement Award in 2015. Uh, please join me in welcoming Joan. Good morning. I wanted to begin by thanking Contemporary Calgary, um, and particularly Lisa and Joanne and Nate, for organizing this stimulating event. Both the symposium and the exhibition, in my opinion, model a type of art conversation and art community that I'm very happy to be a part of. It's an honor to be included in this reflective space and to moderate this morning's panel. So our panel is called Art Writing and Knowledge Production. And I'm gonna begin with uh, a description of the panel as originally conceptualized. And then I will make some introductory remarks to contextualize the focus uh, and a modification that we collectively arrived at. So the original description is, the introduction of artistic knowledge into educational institutions has presented frictions to epistemic certainties. How have art institutions grappled with this? And what new agencies of art writing do such frictions generate? What kinds of unproductivities or productive refusals might art writing contribute to the precarious economies of artistic and institutional labor? And here is my interpretation of a modified version of that description. As a form of knowledge production, art writing wrestles with and articulates ways of knowing on multiple levels how one writes, in relation to what one writes, in relation to received notions of writing, is central to the possibility of generating knowledge. The three panelists that you're about to hear from approach their writing praxis through a form of criticality where notions of ethics loom large. They prefer to write with and through art rather than about art. They explore the ways thinking pushes up against the materiality of language and gives shape to something that, once made public, has the potential for evocation and politics. Their writing takes form through sustained engagements with art, artists, and real and imagined audiences. They explore what is valued and tended to and seek out and create configurations and platforms that support new agencies and forms of critical practice. So you are about to um, hear three different performative presentations. A virtual presentation by Maria Fusco uh, and she sends her regrets. Ear infections and air travel are not great companions. And Maria is very disappointed that she was not able to join us and <clears throat> we miss her, but she has recorded uh, both the presentation and then following that, a Q&A response. So we still have her presence. We also have an improvisational or free associational presentation by Jean Randolph and a poetic mock lecture by Kristen Kreider. 
The order uh, that this will happen in is first uh, Kristen Kreider, then Jean Randolph, and then Maria Fusco. And I just want to mention that after Maria Fusco's recorded presentation, we will then have a recorded uh, response from her to questions that we prepared in advance and sent to her. And so now I would, <clears throat> excuse me, like to um, do some introductions by reading um, some of the bios for these three people. So in order of the presentation, Kristen Kreider is a writer and artist. Her research stems from an interest in the poetics of thought, its materialization and form, and a concern with how artworks relate to the world. She has published poetry, essays, journal articles, and a single authored monograph entitled Poetics and Place, The Architecture of Sign, Subject and Sight through I.B. Torres. In collaboration with the architect James O'Leary, Kristen's pra artistic practice engages with sites of architectural and cultural interest. Combining aspects of performance, installation, documentary, poetry, fiction, and image making, the work of Kreider and O'Leary exposes and interweaves the complexities of place into a fabrication of the real. Their book, Falling, was published by Copy Press. Something called Field Poetics is a forthcoming uh, from Eros Press. And they are currently working on a large-scale project, Ungovernable Spaces, engaging with five sites of community and resistance globally um, that are in, in a global context. Uh, Kristen is professor of fine art and director of the art research program at Goldsmiths College in London. Jean Randolph is a Canadian cultural theorist, performer, and author who is renowned for her method of fictocritical writing that emerged in Canada in the 1980s. Dr. Randolph was also the first and only writer in Canada to develop object relations psychoanalytic theory as a medium for cultural criticism. She has um, authored numerous texts, Psychoanalysis and Synchronized Swimming, Symbolization and Its Discontents, Why Stoics Box, The Ethics of Luxury, and more recently, Shopping Cart Pantheism, and Out of Psychoanalysis, Fictocriticism. And Maria Fusco is a Northern Irish writer, theorist, and critic who is internationally recognized for her work in fiction, radio, and theoretical writing, as well as her foundational work in the field of fiction as a critical practice. She is the founder and editorial director of experimental art writing journal, The Happy Hypocrite, former director of arts writing at Goldsmiths, University of London, and is currently reader in interdisciplinary writing at the University of Edinburgh. She was the writer in residence at the Lisbon Architecture Triennial, the Caddest Art Foundation in Paris, and the White Chapel in London. And in 2018, she will be research fellow at Amsterdam School for Cultural Analysis, University of Amsterdam. So I'd like to begin by inviting Kristen Kreider to the floor. Hello, hi, um, can everybody hear? Great. Um, so first I just wanted to say thank you. Um, there's lots of thank yous and there's lots to be thankful for for this event, it's wonderful. Um, so thank you to Lisa, Joanne and Nate for the organization um, and Contemporary Calgary and everyone involved. And I'm also delighted and honored to be on this panel um, with Jean and Maria and Joan. We've had some great discussions um, by email and in person the past couple days um, leading up to it. So I'm, I'm really grateful. Um, 
Okay, so I've got a clicker, let's see if it works. Um, so as, as Joan mentioned, um, I'm working on a larger scale project now with my partner, James O'Leary, um, called Ungovernable Spaces. Um, and the project involves looking at five different uh, situations. Um, one is the, uh, oh, you know what? Okay, uh, the situation title is not showing up, um, which might bode well, or might not bode well for how it shows up later. Um, but we're on it um, because there's footnotes. But the, f the first um, situation is the open city in Valparaiso, Chile. Um, and it's a, a radical pedagogical experiment that was started in 1971 by a poet and an architect, and it still exists now. Um, the second one um, is uh, the, the, the Belfast uh, wall clusters, the peace walls um, in Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, myself and James have a piece of work in the exhibition relating to this, and that's actually what I'm gonna read today is the piece relating to this. Um, the third is, um, the I ITT campus in Chicago, on the south side of Chicago, and it's a, a situation where um, the urban plan for the ITT campus was, uh, by Mies van der Rohe, was overlain um, uh, on the south side of Chicago, which was the um, then known as the Black Belt of Chicago. So we're looking at that, and that's actually, um, we're looking at that through the work of Victor Bergen. So that is an art writing in that sense. Um, and I was going to read that um, today, but it's a longer piece of work, and when I tried to shorten it, it uh, <laughs> um, okay. Uh, the fourth um, is the uh, Gandhi Salt March. Uh, so we visited, we uh, re retraced the Salt March last year, um, and so that's looking at um, basically that moment of kind of political theater, really, um, and also the kind of uh, Gandhi's ashram and his his entire um, uh, lifestyle, really, or li not lifestyle, but his. Um, uh, strategies and tactics of resistance, and, and we're looking at that. Um, and the fifth one is, we haven't visited yet, and it's so new, so I just stuck it up here, I'm not even sure about the figure. Um, but it's uh, the Omoja village in Kenya, which is a, um, an all-female matriarchal uh, village um, uh, started up in response to uh, certain uh, violences and atrocities where uh, the women upped stakes and started their own, and they're doing really well. <laughs> so we look forward to visiting that. Um, I've got some questions, I'm just gonna hold them in the air because they're kind of forwarding the project um, overall. And the first question is, uh, what does it mean to be governed? What does it mean to resist? How do aesthetics play a part in this configuration and reconfiguration of the political? And how is this affected by our poetics of making sense of the world and of one another? So, small questions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, um, and the other thing, as, as this project is progressing, there's these three words, um, and we've heard them echoing around the rooms um, lately. I'll, I'll, if Lisa's here, Lisa Robertson, Lisa introduced me to Emil Benveni's essay a couple of years ago, and I know you did the workshop here with that, um, and it influenced me greatly, and I'm really, really appreciative, and I've moved into thinking about rhythm and um, reading around rhythm and cities and, and this kind of thing, and likewise, um, form and figure. So these, these words are kind of echoing in the project, um, and I've put them in a triangle. I'm not really sure if that's the right shape for that, but um, I also have a quote that, that's been helping me kind of think through the relationship of these three words in the project overall. And it's Cecilia Vicuña. Um, a word is a non-place for the encounter to take place. So just allowing those three words throughout this project to just kind of encounter one another and seeing what happens. Um, so I am going to read um, uh, from the 13 points expanded, it's the piece of writing that's related to um, the piece of work that's in the exhibition. Um, so there's a video in the exhibition which is a uh, really, really sliced down version of this longer piece. And there are footnotes, and I'm noticing that the slides are a little short, so if the footnotes don't show up, and if you wanna know um, what those uh, footnotes are, I can, I can tell you later, but um, in case it kind of disappears off the slide. Um, but just to give you a little bit of uh, um, background, the peace wall clusters have existed and developed as markers of sectarian division in Belfast for the past 45 years. Um, and the writing seeks to explore the physical, psychological, emotional, and imaginative effects of this on the city. Um, and it'll take the form of this poem lecture. Um,
one. A droplet falls and swerves, marking the birth of a political event. A confusing turbulence follows, becoming civil war. Elements now polarized congeal and crystallize into bodies seen marching or fleeing from a street on fire. Families are displaced, decay and decline. A burnt out bus between the falls and the Shankill Road severs connection through vernacular divide. All of this, or something similar, will happen again. The vortical logic will hold. The pattern will repeat, each time with a slight variation, each time leaving behind a wall. Meanwhile, on the hill overlooking the city, a figure stands with feet spread and arm raised, an oratory gesture in apparent stasis that solicits elusive unity. A bird flies overhead. Emissions rise from his fingertips like the wisps of a fog. The streets pulse with a history of combat. Paint bomb traces, redacted graffiti, and walled off back gardens assemble. Here is problem with many origins, actions enmeshed in a web of interconnectivity suffused with heterogeneous affect. Politics infused with the psychic realities of the present past become public. Here, a new form of community asserts itself in a warlike manner. Feet take us out the front door. Bodies mobile move between the plenum of Ardoin and the porosity of Glenbryn, activating the relation between them, its legacy of violence. One witness experienced it thus. The weight that one body may have in history, the hardness inside compressing to an unreasonable atomic weight outside of scale, act outside of scale with little hope to an audience of one. His skeleton, basic impulse of protest against corporate exoskeletons crowded to a shell. The notion that there was something inside that can change through will alone, dropping hard to match a weapon. This articulation of fact stands testament to a blanket force, a strange kind of power that fights and resists, an unknowable outside right inside the outside, right inside the body, that makes visible a singular disruption. Three. What does it mean to say, this wall is alive? It means that this wall is not dead. It means that this wall has a life. It means that this wall is a life, understood as pure event. It means that this wall is alive as a philosophical concept containing only virtuals, made up of virtualities. Off of Springfield Road, there is a wall painted with a number of fantasy figures. Superman, Wonder Woman, Batman, Catwoman, Flash Gordon, two or three others. Each figure is an active force, shattering bricks with a necessary violence exploding a way through the wall. And behind each figure, through the wall, skies are bursting with orange and yellow rays. Buildings scrape the skyline in pink-purple silhouette. If it is true that some love the wall while it is standing, it is also true that others will, will love it only after it is gone. Four. In response to the persistence of violence, communities strengthen their borders with ad hoc assemblages of timber pallets, old furniture, burnt out vehicles, and other rubble. When these exclamatory inter interjections into the social order began to impact the, <clears throat> impact the mobility of state force, bureaucracy intervened. A document dated 9th of September, 1969, outlines a set of conditions to be announced by the Prime Minister on TV. Two, 
a peace line was to be established to separate physically the walls and the Shankill communities. Initially, this would take the form of a temporary barbed wire fence, which would be manned by the army and the police. The actual line of fence would be decided in consultation with the Belfast Corporation. It was agreed that there should be no question of the peace line becoming permanent, although it was acknowledged that the barriers might have to be strengthened in some locations. Years later, after the anti-globalization demonstrations at the G8 summit, a high-ranking Italian police officer will say this to the newspaper La Repubblica. Look, I'm now going to tell you something that's not easy for me and that I have never told anyone. The police aren't there to put things in order, but to govern disorder. Five. Wall is a single point expanded. There is more than one wall in this place. Around every wall is an environment, and at certain times, say, in periods of unrest, we who inhabit this place expand. That is, our sense of self or ego expands to fill the entire environment. We individuals, our sense of self, expands beyond the boundary of our skin, and in this way, the environment becomes thick with emotion, thick like fog or like smoke billowing up from each individually lit fire. After the fires on Clifton Park Avenue, they erected a dense stratification of concrete foundation, concrete block, profiled metal sheeting, mild steel angles, scaffold bar, razor wire, metal palisade fencing, and roller spikes. Over time, these materials have changed, and more recently, the heavy, opaque constructions have been replaced by a lighter, more candid fencing. Perhaps one day, one day these will all be retractable, like the one on St. Matthew's Court, with its potential to be not a wall. Perhaps even later, sometime in the future, all, all of the walls will degenerate into mere geometry, a simple line. But whatever its material, the idea of wall will always remain. For generations now, there has been nothing in the world more important. Six. The wall in Alexandra Park is comprised of segments that tack welded together form a single unified plane that cuts across the whole of the park, drawing distinction. In 2011, a gate was inserted into the wall, onto which was painted a photorealistic de depiction of the parkland beyond. On the 16th of September, the gate was opened, and for the first time in 17 years, members of the local community crossed the park without digging holes underneath the wall or using ladders to climb over the top. Today, the gate is open from 9 a.m. until 4 p.m., and when walking through, it is difficult to say if one is inside or outside. But let us return to the violence that is just under the skin and the pathology of atmosphere from which symptoms arise. Stomach ulcers, nephritic colic, menstruation trouble in women, sleeplessness, hair turning white, accelerated cardiac rhythm and intense sweating, generalized con contraction with muscular stiffness, skin disorders. From all of this, we know that by its very nature, power is separatist and regionalist that its aim is to divide what it seeks to control and that, consciously or not, our aim is to resist. Seven. In Elephant, a short film directed by Alan Clark for the BBC in 1989, we watch the backs of 18 men walk through public park parks, leisure centers, industrial buildings, and neighborhood streets. We watch as they find their target and dispassionately shoot their weapon. We watch as they walk, we watch as they walk away and as the camera lingers over each fresh, fresh corpse, opening space. Limestone Road is lined with five security cameras, a reminder that the interface is not just a wall, but a dispersed and heterogeneous set of conditions an accumulation of techniques and affect. 
one that cannot be fully described and instead must be pieced together from dis disparate and contradictory fragments, an impossible anatomy, an autopsy with unruly cause. We find ourselves looking over our shoulders. A man comes out of his house and stands on the corner of Madrid and Bryson Street, smoking a cigarette. Another man follows, ambiguously proffering a spit. Eight. Situated on the outskirts of the city, the basalt crop of Cave Hill resembles, resembles the profile of a man lying down. Its craggy silhouette is rumored to have inspired Jonathan Swift's 18th century saf satire, Gulliver's Travels. The tale begins with Gulliver washed up on the island of Lilliput, where he lies, tied and prone, imprisoned by this nation of tiny people. At the end of the tale, Gulliver encounters a race of talking horses. Intelligent and civilized, they rule over the filthy, brutish yahoos, who are humans in their most base form. Through his depiction of the yahoos, Swift promotes the ideal of civil society, understood, ooh, <laughs> understood as a politically well-regulated community devoid of violence. Such an ideal echoes those advanced earlier in Italian courts and Parisian salons, where it was suggested that the threat of incivility, understood as the threat of violence, could be overcome through artificial conventions, refined speech, polite manners, and effeminate styles of dress, for example. Making manners mild and civil, bringing them under good government or good law, such artifice was thought to distance human beings from their otherwise base and brutish habits. Over time, as the walls have be become a more permanent feature of the urban infrastructure, they have evolved to incorporate aspects of ornament and decoration, inlaid patterns of brickwork, the rhythmic oscillation of yellow and blue semicircles. These aspiring signs of civility become, belie a monopoli monopolization of violence by the state, and with it, scores to be settled either tomorrow or the day after. Nine. Circular forts made out of limestone blocks were common in Ireland throughout the Dark Ages. Castles were introduced after the Norman invasion of Ireland in the late 1160s. Hundreds of these castles, varying in shape, size, and the exact configuration of fortification, can be found throughout Ulster, their figures in plan revealing a long history of defensive architecture. Consider this that the history of thought since the Enlightenment has be been a confrontation with the loss of a cosmological center. That since the start of the modern age, the human world has had to learn to accept and to integrate new truths about an outside that bears no relation to the human. That, according to one philosopher, these are shellless times for which we compensate by creating a dimension where humans can be contained, like the concept of globalization or the image of a ball-shaped Earth surrounded by an orbit of space junk. At the interface, things stripped of human cause assemble, formations with the potential to become political. One segment of a broken gate, a plastic bottle, a glass bottle, a litter of tree branches, bits of algae and plants, the edges of a concrete wall, a leather ball still floating. We are told that the word force is not a synonym for violence, with which it is often conflated. Instead, it should be reserved in terminological language to refer to the forces of nature or the force of circumstances. That is, to indicate the energy released by physical or social movements. Forces thus distinguish from the more instrumental character of violence, which must always seek to justify itself either through means or ends. Freed from this moral constraint, and with it, history's ceaseless search for a cause, force becomes creative, capable of infinite interconnected relations and motley assemblages. 
like a thousand plastic bags shredded and wrapped around razor wire, or the spontaneous coming together of a people outside of state control. Eleven. It is impossible to distinguish between form and color. We cannot conceive of a colorless line or a colorless space or any formless relation of color. In this way, color territorializes, even if its divisions are, in, like those of language, in the first instance, arbitrary. How so? Take the color spectrum, along which color appears in a continuum, no separation. In order to make a distinction, we draw lines and name the spaces between them, red, orange, green, blue. In this way, we order our world through a rhythmic scale of difference, to which we ascribe the significance of that street curb over there, those fence posts, these countless flags and murals, and the perennial lines of people marching down domestic streets. Oops. <laughs> Elsewhere, next to the pink pavilion, a young Romanian couple operate a car wash in an otherwise empty parking lot one blue and one red bucket, benign participants in this alternative economy at the interstice of sectarian geography. Twelve. A series of film clips presents Belfast in September 1969 after a night of heavy rioting. One bit of footage shows an early ad hoc interface through which a number of children and a few women are moving by ducking underneath the wheels of a large vehicle. Perhaps it is this porosity that has sustained the interface for so long. The fact that it is a system of interdictions and allowances. Walls, but also gates, kettles, industrial buffer zones, open derelict land areas and motorways a system capable of shutting down at any sign of unrest, and open just enough not to need to resist. The interface here, in Suffolk Lenadoon, is one of the city's success stories. The two communities, working together, have taken down the wall, and in its place, built a row of commercial units, including a coffee house and a pharmacy, as well as offices for a community forum, a regeneration project, and a counseling project. Perhaps it is the fact that the interface has become an institution, one that attracts both tourism and funding, that has sustained it for so long. Thirteen. A popular legend speaks to the origin of the Red Hand of Ulster. The Kingdom of Ulster has no heir so rival chieftains hold a boat race to decide who will rule. Whoever's hand touches the Irish shore first will be made king. And when it becomes apparent to one of the, the chieftains that he is losing the race, he cuts off his hand and throws it to the shore where it lands first. Another origin. The Belfast City Cemetery is built in 1869 between the Falls and the Springfield Road. Serving as a burial ground for the city's growing population, the plots are divided into Catholic and Protestant areas. These areas are separated by a wall sunk deep into the ground, nine feet deep. And every day, and every year, and every decade since, the soil around the wall has been moving and shifting, its particles tilled and sifted by countless little mouths. Thank you. Howdy, thank you for getting ready to listen. It's a privilege to be here, and I'm just delighted with how much 
intellection and thought and laughter has been going on to feed our brains. Uh, the first slide is the only one that I know of that is deliberate to offer a, a metaphor for the art writer. <laughs> now let us see what else is in the carousel. Uh, when I look at this, it reminds me of a slide of kidney cells. And that reminds me that we're now learning slowly what, frankly, I've known all along, <laughs> that the brain is not the only place that thinks. And I'm sure the kidney has a lot to tell us. And I'm sure the kidney, with its innervation of dendrites, tells a story that is spoken in image if we could only see the kidney, which we cannot. So never mind. <laughs> What's the next one? This, oh yeah, I, I, um, Hmm. I, I actually wondered whether there's water in this pool. <laughs> and sadly, um, to see someone dive into this pool, I think would uh, be a tear in the diegesis of modernism. I also like the possibility, I, I like the possibility, I haven't seen this slide in a long time. You, you see, I have a lot of them. This would look just as good upside down. And I think, I think that uh, we should consider that as uh, a mode of thought. You know, as children, we often lie upside down and pretend that the ceiling is the floor, but that's gone out of fashion by the time you reach high school. What is the next slide? Well, I'll be darned. Now, here is a... Uh, it's somewhat of a Rorschach test, but it's, it's got a good form, so you needn't feel that your id will come too much to the surface. Um, when you're an, writing about art or you're an artist, which one of these people are you? We do know, though, we make up quite a splash. <laughs> hmm. I wonder what the next slide is. Um, oh, I, I'm going to get theoretical, even though this is brutally uh, documentary. Uh, D.W. Winnicott, from whom I stole all my ideas. And let me recommend that when you find a good idea in a theoretical text, give it another name <laughs> and claim it as your own. <laughs> as you may know, I wrote uh, a long time ago something called The Amenable Object. That is a strict example of that kind of thievery. <laughs> However, what I respect about uh, Winnicott's thought is um, that he reminds us that in the most meaningful spaces of a culture, 
there is no there sh there is unlikely to be the danger that you will be maimed or killed. We symbolize that in our worst moments as fired, humiliated, losing face, failing. That's the worst that can happen in a cultural environment. Compared to being murdered, I think we all have enough self-respect to be able to handle a little humiliation. It's not funny. OK, now, what's the next slide? Hmm. I, I'm going to take the. I'm going to take this as an artwork. I think somebody, somebody set this up. Somebody set this up as an essay on language. One way of speaking, as we all know, and those of us who love precision and those of us who hate precision, um, is how language sorts itself into definitions and how definitions sort themselves into information and how for some ways of speaking meaning is meaning is contained as if you could just carry it around on the back of a truck and the important thing would be that the meaning or information got from here to there. <laughs> but in some cultures, meaning is made on a, on a spectrum, on a fuzzy wall where words blend into each other or have no definition or shape shift, or eschew precision. You know, I like Aristotle for only one reason. He said there are some situations where precision is not going to do you any good. <laughs> and I think in this time of technological domination, we should keep that in mind. Those of you who are academics, however, uh, have to contend with the possibility that there's a great demand for precision in your thought. And you, and uh, well, heck, that's why I am not in school. <laughs> uh, hmm. Uh, is my face blue? Y'all should. Do you remember the old days when you could look into a perspective, a, a, a projector, and there's this little, uh, this fantastically pure light, a circle of light, just like, just like when you're dying. Okay, I'm going to not follow the light. Um, uh, what's the next one? Oh boy, let's see now. What's this a metaphor? of. Uh, I certainly agree that a lot of thought and memory and knowledge and wishful thinking and imagination uh, is possible when you use a metaphor. A metaphor, a metaphor is like a door. Oh Lord, what came before the metaphor? I would adore to know, but I have no idea. <laughs> a metaphor, the, the, oh, oh, you know, I think this is a metaphor for life in the 21st century. Well, let's see, because, um, because you think you're choosing all sorts of different things, but underneath the plastic, actually their form is all the same, which means in a sense, uh, and I'm trying to figure out which is ideology, the plastic that covers the, the identical
products or the identical products as, as a, actually just a materialization of ideology. And of course, you know the ideology I'm talking about. There's two of them right now that are uh, oppressing us and we must rise against them. We must unite. The technological ethos, which treats everything like a problem to be solved. And of course, consumerism, which becomes a form of thought and behavior without your even knowing it. So if you're trying to consume me right now, <laughs> there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, what's the next? Uh... Now, this man, this man, you know, actually, I think he's upside down. <laughs> I think the slide is upside down. I think this looks like a guy who's trying to signal to his captors, take me down from, I'm hanging upside down, will you please save me? Uh, I'm hanging in space. I can't tell what planet that is. And I'm a gentleman of reason and staunch morality. And if you're hanging me upside down like this, I can't do my job. And my job is to boss you. So why have you kidnapped me? <laughs> Hmm. We'll never know the answer, so let's look at another slide. Oh, yeah, okay, let me try to read this. It's an important point about bacteria. Uh, let's see. Um, others will flourish on gelose glucose, and some will grow on biclementine, and others will flourish on acid and some will grow on glucose ordinaire and others will flourish on gelatinous rosé and some will grow on bullion. <laughs> uh, can you identify with that? I mean, I, I identify with that. <laughs> Uh, there are, um, I guess you would say, there are other realms of art writing uh, that we could flourish in. Uh, what it would take to, um, what it would take to discover those realms, the realm of mm, by Clementine and gelatin rosé. Maybe those are the realm of cocktails. This goes to another, yeah, you know, this does remind me, this is so theoretical. Uh, D.W. Winnicott did say that there, what we all don't may consider invisible is the holding environment. And in a sense, whether it's groups of people or solitary people, their holding environment is that which they internalize and nourish. So the holding environment for most of us here is some form of art, scene, community, grouping, uh, site. And of course, we're all trying to find a way that that allows us or we take the privilege of flourishing and contributing to culture. Right now, contemporary Calgary is not in a very good holding environment from a civic point of view, but that can change, of course. That's a worst case scenario. Uh, the best case scenario is this symposium itself, where we're all listening to each other and curious, and I haven't seen any fist fights break out. Did they last night when everybody got drunk and started dancing? <laughs> were chairs thrown? I wish I'd been there if they were. <laughs> Not that I'm a violent person. I have violent thoughts, but no action. 
Oh, I'm off the topic. Uh, do we have another? Hmm. Uh, well, first of all, I'm struck with the coincidence that Kristen was talking about walls. And this is one of my favorite walls. I, I took this photo in Toronto and I came upon uh, the yellow streak, uh, the urine colored yellow streak, but I know it wasn't urine. Uh, it, was, it wasn't messy enough. But there is an aspect, a modernist aspect in spite of the texture, uh, the, the barrenness, the, the minimalism, uh, the balance. You know, what's so amazing is that modernism is sort of like what Marshall McLuhan said. It, modernism was a cool medium. Uh, it invited projection because there was no narrative unless you were so sensitive, which I happen to be, so sensitive that just the way an angle or a, or a, or the rhythm of the bricks or something in focus and out of focus told a story. And m modernism, minimalism evoked that out of us. If you can't see the story in a minimalist building from 1930 by looking up to it like just like this, Well, I, I mean, I don't want to be critical, but there's something wrong with you. <laughs> um, this reminds me of something else, um, but I wonder if it's worth saying. No, it probably isn't. No, don't even ask me afterwards because I'm not gonna tell you. It's not worth saying. I think I'm just going to look at the next slide. You know, this, I felt so silly when I realized I still have this in my, uh, uh, in my, my slide collection. This is my slide collection. Well, this is part of it. I just reached in here and got a handful of them and stuck them in the, in the, in the projector. You don't want to be too aware of what your material is. Because then you can, have you ever heard of a philobat? Well, a philobat is someone who it's not meant to be about a bat, but it's someone it's someone who likes to fly between words and ideas, someone who soars through the empty void between ideas and words, and if I and I'm a philobat. So if I'm too acquainted with an image, then I can't fly between it and the next one that I'm not acquainted with. And when you can't drift and float like that, you, you, uh, you stymie your uh, subconscious. Now, I believe that Freud made a mistake about the subconscious when he corrected his original idea about the subconscious. His original idea was that the subconscious was accessible by certain special means, uh, but that it was some flow of, ex of representation and memory, even re representation by Im image, of course, or sensation. And you know, you know, actually, I'm, I'm surprised Freud didn't discover that there are extracranial thoughts of cogitation all over the body. But anyway, um, the subconscious is available. It's not a mysterious glob down there that sends up uh, signals of desire. Um, we all know we can summon up our damn desire anytime we want to. But the subconscious uh, is a place that can be unleashed if you, if you provide, even within yourself, standing right here. Uh, oh, hmm. You know, this is a lot like the center of a, um, 
You know those daisies that are called cone flowers? They have um, a, a mesh-like, absolute perfect uh, structure, uh, much more complicated than a, a buckyball or uh, the geodesic dome. And oh, am I distracted? Where was I? I think I was talking about the subconscious. It can be evoked. It can be ignited. It's waiting there. It's just waiting there like a teenager by the telephone. <laughs> art, art in all its forms, which would include art writing, is a, is a conduit, or perhaps you might say a, um, a singular existential figure sitting at the bar at Hotel Arts, ordering a double martini. <laughs> and if you drink it fast enough, your subconscious will be so happy to come forth and come forth and, and um, give you a form of knowledge or give you a, a, a version of knowledge that if you were too busy talking to a taxi driver, you would never have been subject to it. That's what all forms of art can do. Conversation can do that. And of course, the most primitive form, psychoanalysis. Uh, oh, oh, it's this door. It's this, this damn door. You know, I wish I didn't even have this slide up here. Every time I, I, I come across it, uh, accidentally, of course, in a talk, <laughs> I think of that damn doors of perception back in the 60s with the LSD stuff. Uh, and, and I, I wish, I, okay, if this is the doors of the perception, doors of perception, let's just keep it closed. That kind of perception <laughs> that becomes so cool and a subject of songs, it's really good in its time. But if it sticks in your mind like a, a tick you didn't see on your hind end, <laughs> it's time to forget it. Now, there must be another slide. My God, I hope there's another slide. <laughs> oh, yes, another artwork. Now, let's see. Okay, I'm going to write a piece of fictacrism about this um, in a few decades. And um, how would that fictocriticism go? Well, of course, the first the first condition would be, I can't, I'm not going to write about it unless the artist begs me to. Now, what I mean by beg, <laughs> what I mean by beg is really caring and knowing what they're getting into. Well, with any of us, if you really care and want to know what you're getting into, you have to be have a commitment to that person on some level and their work and that otherwise you couldn't possibly oh they're coming to get me <laughs> they're coming to get me oh my god <laughs> beautiful you guys beautiful Art writing is gesture, or John Malkovich's middle name is Gavin. You are not listening to my real voice. This is an imitation of my real voice. Art writing is gesture. 
is a frustration with exhausted modes of critical engagement expressed in regularly form within our elite cultural world. Gesture here is defined as an act that is motivated. What is loitering behind the invocation of an act that is motivated are the subjects who are acted upon and the direct causes impelling such subjects, ourselves, to experience a desire sufficiently pressing enough to affect scriptural change through our belief in the simple marks on a page. The obvious question this motivation elicits, therefore, from the mouths of first word textbooks is, what is so wrong with the way I write anyway? An answer to this understandable enough question would be, I don't like it. Another answer, the way you write is not precise enough. Another answer, your job is to dismantle, not to build. Another answer, I don't want to be colonised by you again. Another answer, you don't own that. Put it back where you found it. Another answer, the language of history is contagion, not antidote. Another answer, my final answer, the way you write hides the way you write. Language games must be accosted in each dark alley in which they lurk. It is not sufficient to be able to simply voice a proficient echo of an historical form, however hilarious this might be, because this demonstrates only proficiency. Whilst it's the wish of all of us who are self-conscious and precocious enough to want to be witnessed publicly as being proficient, finally, we cannot place trust in, nor shit from the great arse, of this vain glorious instinct. As with the physical action of employing a lever, it's essential to depress when we wish to elevate. Accurate navigation is a perilous yet patent responsibility of the analytic enterprise. This invocation of navigation does not agree that legislative plans are always fit for purpose. Rather, navigation here describes precision of intent, exposing the ethical responsibility of the deeds of the writer to our reader, or if we are very lucky, to our readers plural. It's grand to live alone on a small island tending our inky crops, as long as it's possible for other folk to locate and perhaps even visit the island when we want them to. This is duty as mandate. This is duty as tax. Thrift is the app schematic here. Thrift trades sparse and tactful forms, not mass reproducible mementos. Thrift is good example, but not an example. Thrift is sensible. Thrift carves up. The art writer as gesture is diligent as a miser. When constriction is applied to the wordage permitted by thrift, transubstantiation occurs. We are no longer shuffling marks about on a page, on a screen. We are creating new beings. The role constriction plays is that of the joyful enforcer, not of the tyrannical polemic. Acting with contextual knowledge and candour. Consistency shares a little more than half of its letters with constriction. This is clearly an alphabetic coincidence, but an apt one, for consistency and constriction cannot be disaggregated. 
The two are mutually dependent at a technical level because insistent application and physical manipulation of both is required for new limber analytic topologies. Together, constriction and consistency make a pair of muscular thighs. Our heads are happily clenched between these very thighs. This desire for anonymity is a useful proviso against solely interpretive reading. Reading is essential to both the actual act of producing art writing and the intellectual world in which it bounces about. There is much we must try not to remember. There is so much we must attempt to disauthor. In wishing anonymity in reading, we are also wishing it in writing. Resistance through anonymity is not a relegation of responsibility, rather Anonymity creates commodious possibilities for others' works. And in this way, anonymity permits our writing to exceed us, to exceed our own limited, often class-based ambitions, to assemble. This is knowledge production. It's entirely possible that multiple voices chance on the same formal solution. This is agreeable if it occurs through happenstance because then it demonstrates the right to assemble at one's own will, the right to party. However, there is no prize for the best fancy dress costume. We must not on any account, hide behind those syntactic masks others want to rent us. Not masks, forget masks. Great big fucking gilt mirrors. Understanding our teaming methodologies as stroboscopic, we may apprehend only small moments, only our own small moments not a linear historical discursive. We are always a stranger. That was uh, Maria Fusco's recording. And um, <laughs> and uh, we sent um, questions to her. Um, that responded specifically, in some cases, to her presentation, and in other cases, to her practice uh, more generally. So you're now going to hear that recording from her. That's, we've, in, in this way, we're moving into the question and answer period. And then following that recording, um, we'll take our position up here and have more of a discussion with you and uh, with the panelists. Hello, it's Maria. It is 5.16 p.m. in Glasgow and it is raining. I'm very sorry not to be there. Q&A is always my favourite part of panel presentations. I like getting really hard questions. Uh, what I'm going to do is, oh, also to say that having questions in advance somehow makes them more difficult to answer which is annoyingly counterintuitive. I'm just going to answer these straight through. Uh, so there will be a lot of eyeing and umming, and I will try to make sense. I will try not to waffle too much. And I will be re-recording it. I'll try and just do it through, fresh. I've clustered the questions, and thank you very much for the considered questions. I really enjoyed engaging with them. Uh, there were too many for me to answer in 15 minutes, so I've tried to cluster them together and to, to kind of group my thoughts. 
I'll read the questions out first and then I've, I've made some notes which I'll work from because otherwise it would be me just waffling on. Okay, here we go. So, for the first section there are four questions. I'm going to read you them all out. Um, how does the sense of the dilettante or amateur influence your methods of working? You've said that art writing is, quote, an anthology of examples, unquote. Can you unpack this for us? Flann O'Brien, the third policeman, this is a question, in an article in Freeze magazine, you mentioned that if you had only one book to put in your reading list, it would be this one. Can you tell us what it is about the specific book that's made its greatest influence on you? And the final kind of fourth part of the uh, fourth question, in an interview you suggested that as an artist you felt dissatisfied with making objects and found writing more active. You've also suggested that had art writing had more visibility, you might have started with writing and could you comment on this evolution? So uh, first of all, um, on the ideal syllabus, which was the phrase article that I wrote, I did say that Flanna Brown's the third policeman was incredibly important to me. He's probably better known for uh, his book At Swim Two Birds, which is a sort of an amazing, metalliptic, self-reflexive, bizarre novel. It's often cited as the first postmodern novel. Um, and for me, Flanna Brown's use of history and mythology, in addition to the kind of high frequency of the writing, uh, it's like something, you know, a dog or a bat could hear. It's very appealing. I mean, it's very emotionally appealing that Flanna Brown only ever wrote two good books, that's one, two birds, and um, the third place, my own favourite, and that all the other books are, are notations or addendums to these two, because he was, um, probably because he was um, a raving alcoholic, his head began to disperse, so he returned to themes. Of course, he's a very good journalist as well. So there's a sense, I suppose, of completeness in that, which is very appealing to me. Um... I wasn't a bookish child. We didn't have books in the house. Um, so when I say that I'm very influenced by particular books, certainly at a younger age, that's because I had read very little. Uh, however, I retain those books which are important to me uh, still. Oh, I should tell you, actually, um, we had a brilliant public library in Belfast, Belfast City Library, which was really, really super. Um, and I joined it, well, was brought to join it when I was four. And um, two interesting things, which I think probably do have a relationship with how I am in terms of how writing behaves in public or what's informed, um, yes, how I think about writing in public, is firstly the day I joined, I wet myself in the library. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that probably like a year or something after I joined. I was only wee, so I can't remember exactly. I was pulling a book out of, of um, a big shelf and the bookshelf fell on me. And all of the, I was lying under the bookshelf with all of the books on top of me for quite a long time because there was no one in the library. And I had this very close, intimate relationship with the, the books and the smell of them. And most of them had plastic wrappers around them, of course, at that time. And often when I... Um, publish a book and, 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 and I'm hard on the book. I think of that moment of lying under this um, avalanche of books. I digress. So, guess what I want to say about with Flann O'Brien is that television was very important to me. And I think what's important, uh, what I want to say about what's important about television in regards to how one sort of influences methods um, and develops one's methods is that I don't think that things have any intrinsic value or or what one thing has more intrinsic value than another. I believe that the value that we give to them is through critical inquiry. So I watched all television in Rugrio, everything, all of it, that was all I ever did. And it was a combination of not having any money, being very poor. And also I grew up in Belfast during the Troubles and we actually couldn't go out very much. I know that sounds a bit made up, but it was actually true. In the area that I grew up in. So because I watched everything, um, 
good things, shite things, the whole lot of things. This kind of completeness again, this idea of completeness again, was important to me in terms of how to sort and how to find out what I was interested in, how to find my subject. Uh, I'm still exactly like this methodologically um, with work. Um, let's say, um, I yes, I... I I, I prefer going to places like I spent some time in Cadiz Art Foundation in Paris, Critic in Residence. Of course, it was beautiful. Paris is fantastic. But I started to get a bit irritated because it was so perfect and so beautiful. Um, obviously, just the central bits, you know, because of their manicure to be, to be like that. But I prefer being in places where I have to to find, to scratch through stuff, to find other stuff. So you can see there's a sort of, there's a perverseness in it and perhaps there is an immature perverseness in it in terms of, of, of um, uh, yes, perhaps it's immature. But it's, it's in a sense, I suppose what I'm trying to say, um, and this is why I stick also, I think, to Flano Brown, is that he's, a, he's an empty role model. I think that um, this 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 methodology, this way of working, is more led by a, um, a critical or maybe let's say a critic a criticality, a way of looking. And there is of course this idea which came up in the question of being slightly dilettantish about it. I'm very keen to retain that. I want to retain the sense of being the amateur. I think that's very common and important to people who've moved from one discipline to the other, to always start from scratch. And just in terms of class, one major advantage, and there really aren't that many, <laughs> of growing up being socially deprived, is that you really don't have any role models. You have to start everything from scratch all the time. Um, because, well, like speaking for myself, one's world was very small. So to finally to end with, with these questions, kind of rolling them all in, in together into um, well, like a big ball of plaster sheet or whatever, is, is to say that, that when I say that art writing is an anthology of examples, I guess I mean this in the Georgie Ogandan sense, which he talks about in What is an Apparatus, nice wee small book. Um, he says that an example uh, can only be proved to be an example when it is one amongst many. So this leads me on to another two questions, which I'm going to read out now for you. First one is, uh, the introduction of artistic knowledge into educational institutions has presented frictions to epistemic certainties. What happens when these frictions are harnessed into academic subject areas, such as the MFA art writing programme that you led at Goldsmiths? That's the first one. And the second one is, within the discipline of art writing, what would you say is the difference between criticality and criticism and between art writing and art criticism? Um, I think both of these very interesting questions. Um, maybe start with the second one. I think I'm probably wary about saying criticism at this moment in time, and particularly with having devised um, and ran the programme at Goldsmiths. My vision, if you will, <laughs> of, of art writing, my um, coping mechanism, my tactic, um, I like to think of the difference in the Foucauldian sense between tactic and, um, oh, I've forgotten the other one now, strategy. There we are, strategy. So strategy is overarching, isn't it? And then tactic kind of pokes up away at it, pokes up at the strategy. Tactics is a more natural um, and, I would say, interesting uh, way to work in the so, so my tactic, let's say, of art writing at that time, um, in terms of how I worked with the students, was deliberately always kept in the future tense, in an idea of what art writing might be, rather than trying to define what it was. Clearly, it's necessary to develop some ways of talking about or defining what it is in order to allow space for what it might become. So there's a weird, um, a weird confusion of um, time frames in there, uh, which uh, obviously comes through in practice. And so I suppose in that sense, critical writing, and perhaps slightly distinct from criticism, seems to be a more speculative way and frees one perhaps from more art historical sort of backwards trajectory. And that's something which I've, I've written about at length. Um, I think I have an idea 
that much of the work I've done across education, my own work um, and, and editorial work, is inviting people to join in rather than trying to force them. I was a very shy child. Um, I think the work I've done tries to make visible certain modes of practice and then tries to make them better, to sharpen them through practice. And for me, this is sort of extra disciplinary. Um, I'm interested in building constituencies of people to work together um, by allowing them to come together. I mean, obviously, you have to be aware of predecessors in order not to be foolhardy. And, you know, we all need to kind of look and to read extensively. Um, but these these sort of um, ways, these these potentials of visibility, the programmes such as that one and other ones, of course, afford, I would say, um, I would say that the, they increase the frictions because the frequency, I've used that word before in terms of Flannel Brown's uh, writing, but the frequency um, increases, increases, the, um, increases with the friction um, and it becomes more pro problematic or, uh, yes, becomes more problematic. Um, and I, I think that, I think for me, that's, that's a sort of an interest and that's an interesting way to work um, as, a, as an educator and to work with students. And it very much is this idea of working with people. Um, let's see how we're doing for time. I'm looking at my audio recording time now and it is 12.38. Oh, it's 12.39 now. So maybe I'll move to my last two questions. So the description for this panel asks, how does failure function as a form of resistance? How is failure or perhaps frustration, emotion and affect central to the generation of new knowledge in your writing practice? Uh, the second question is, I'm interested in the relationship between motivation and navigation, between this and tact, tack, tacit. Words like, uh, words that like consistency and constriction also share letters and resonance. In its motivation, to what extent is art writing responsive um, and to who or what? To what extent does it have its destination in mind? To what extent are these two things, responsiveness, responsibility and determination related in the act, the gesture of this writing? So obviously there's a very compound um, notion in there. To, to, to begin to answer those questions, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you out something which actually I was reading yesterday. And it's written by the poet and philosopher, um, uh, philosopher Denise Riley. Denise Riley is the beautiful, um, gravelly, 70s soft porn voice that you will hear in the master rock piece. She's the amateur artist. So in her own, in her own writing, um, in, a, in a, an excellent book called Impersonal Passion, Language Has Effect, Denise says, it's the emotion, I'd say, the linguistic emotion that seeps forward when you find yourself shepherded in the direction of saying what you don't want to say. Rather than caving into the idea that you must stifle your misgivings, it's more helpful in the face of such linguistic bossiness, that noise is me moving a cup off a page, to properly register your own discomfort. There is sound sense in attending to your own nagging embarrassment. With linguistic embarrassment in general, you intuit that under the shivian of standard talk, you're about to be forcibly revealed. Now, that to me is very persuasive and very familiar. So thinking about this gesture of art writing, as per my definition in the recorded panel presentation, it's an act that is motivated. Negative emotions motivate me more than positive ones. Actually, I proactively distrust positive emotions because I suspect people make them up. Now, you might say that's my problem, and you, which would probably be true. However, I'm often bored when I write. Embarrassment, shame, envy, anger, frustration, disappointment. Audience, shout out if you're your own now. Did that work? <laughs> oh, I'll never know. These emotions are predecessors of the pen. New knowledge is instigated by envy, there I've said it. I think this frees uh, me and frees us from having to be too polite um, in, in, in our work. Um, and, and this is somewhat my understanding of responsiveness 
You know, like when you nod your head to give other people positive feedback, which I do all the time because I like to think of myself as being polite in social situations. So this 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 freeing um, with these negative emotions um, permits us to be determined to start again. So there's something I'd just like to end to end with, um, and I've been thinking about it, and I'd like to end by saying that I think that we all need to stop using the term art writing. I think it was needed to bring together a constituency, uh, a loose conglomeration, um, you know, Chris Paget full of practitioners who wanted to get better, better at what they were doing, what they were trying to do. And, and this phrase, art writing, facilitated visibility so that, um, you know, you would know where to go, what to read, what to kind of look at. But now um, we, we know this is possible. Uh, we know that we can keep going and we can hope to get better. Our efforts are visible enough. patients and at noon okay um, so we're going to enter into um, a q and a I have a couple of questions that um, I have prepared I think I'm going to ask one of them to give you an opportunity to um, respond to what you've heard today and my question is um, circles around the notion of form because I think in all three presentations there is something that either sure Ta -da. something that either um, consciously or unconsciously works with the idea of form so if if that was central to the three presentations in some way um, the way that the contours of your writing presentations, performative works, are in dialogue with, um, responsive to the conditions and sites you encounter or make up. Um, certainly to the materiality of language, to the particularities of an artist's work, and quite possibly uh, to the production of new sets of criteria and some type of productive refusals or resistances. But the way that we understand these productive refusals or resistances, I think, is important. Perhaps it means resisting the authority of established conventions uh, and engaging in the transformation of inheritances, norms, and protocols. So I'm curious about uh, both of your's uh, approach to, to form, your relationship to form, the way your writing takes form, and also the way form has the potential to articulate both a politics and a poetics mm -hmm. that inevitably engages with the arena of knowledge production. So how one writes in relation to what one writes, in relation to the received notions of writing, seems central to the possibility of generating knowledge, and also to calling into question established or dominant forms of knowledge production. Kristen, can I ask you to begin? Um, OK. Um, OK. So I, I suppose in the, the work that I do, um, because it is, for start, I work collaboratively. Um, and I also work in relation to particular situations. Um, and earlier, um, uh, that has, or in, in earlier kind of work, it's been 
artworks, um, so working in relation to those. Um, and now it's moved into these um, per, like, you know, um, actual political situations or um, situations of community. So it's a little bit more immediate um, in that respect to, to um, uh, things happening in the world. Um, and, but because of that, um, that specificity, um, one, one of the things that um, I'm always interested in is study um, and a kind of um, developing a sort of relationship to either you know an artwork or a place or another person um, through kind of acts of study, whatever those could be, and they can take the form of I don't know performing or something, or or, or it could be um, recording or or looking or reading, um, and then how that um, and also field um, uh, field visits or site visits that you might go to places and experience them. So there's these these this act of study, and then there's this. Um, this kind of coming away from those situations or just that, that reflective time, that kind of thinking space, um, and how the, the, the two of those come together to find form. Um, and and one, in, in saying that, I, su I suppose one thing um, that's very important to me is that there's no distinction between, or like conceptually, I guess, that there's no distinction between a, a thinking about form and, and content. And this is kind of an old um, argument that's, that's been rehearsed, but I think it's incredibly um, crucial, um, in, especially in terms of thinking as we have been moving into these more um, uh, politically charged situations, um, shall we say, that um, thinking about um, you know, how the urban fabric, you know, as a kind of form um, is um, responding to, you know, the, the, the people that are there and the situations that are there um, and that that has the capacity um, to change. So that's a really important thing. And, and so thinking about um, uh, the way that, that you know, the, that the world basically is comprising um, these kind of um, forms, whether they're improvised forms, um, which are a little bit, we were talking about this yesterday, um, authority really hates improvisation, you know, <laughs> um, because it has the capacity to kind of um, do things that one doesn't expect. And so, um, like in the in the piece I was reading, reading from around Belfast, I mean, that's an, an instance where um, there are particular, um, motivations for people um, either gathering or, or choosing not to gather um, and violences um, historically that would have led to people improvising um, these uh, formal um, barriers, um, so the ad hoc um, moment. And then when those become, I'll use the word like formalized, i.e. when, when you know, the governing bodies step in and say, okay, actually we're going to take what was an ad hoc response to a particular situation and turn it into something concrete, quite literally, then it turns from um, something that is kind of improvised into something that is that is the policing that it, that really turns into the um, policing of relationships and so this piece is trying to you know it's um, I'm not saying it's inserting itself right into that fabric of political reality but through this writing that's sort of um, imitating um, I don't know how else to describe it but in trying to respond to this situation is is trying to kind of think about the complexity of 13 different clusters that have all of these um, all of this materiality, all of this kind of emotional resonance, psychological kind of charge, um, uh, govern, governing, um, you know, urban planning, everything surrounding this, and trying to kind of, um, I don't know, through, through the act of writing, um, study it um, and kind of understand the complexities and um, uh, the, the the condensation of energies that are happening in these um, polarities, these thirteen different polarities, um, and 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 so. I guess in that respect, it's using using writing as a way of um, understanding mm -hmm. um, and, and understanding through acts of um, study, reflection, and then making. So the making of of a, of a piece of work that that attempts to, um, I suppose, st structurally or formally, sort of imitate, but as a way of understanding. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that answers yeah. it a bit, but mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. Jean, could I ask you to respond? Uh, glad I had all that thinking time. <laughs> <laughs> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, in, in terms of performance, since this is what you all actually have actually attended to, uh, to me it's uh, research. It's entirely research. Mm -hmm. I happen to do it in public just the way I do it <laughs> when I'm working on a written piece. So what you see is, a, a, what may seem to be a form, i.e. improvisation, is 
actually a praxis which has no end point. Mm -hmm. So it's the doing of it or the performing of it or the letting it happen of it that is would possibly lead to an insight or an image mm -hmm. or an idea but I'm not really looking or building or concluding anything. It's a, it is a praxis, a process, and I'm allowing myself uh, to live in that process. Uh, just happens to be flamboyantly in public, uh, but, um, but I think that's a mode of of uh, understanding or uh, uh, researching uh, that is probably on some level or another all of us in in the in the uh, creative uh, culture mm. sector on some level to some degree must be doing mm. even if you're not self-conscious about it mm. as much as I am. Great, thank you both. Um, I'm going to see if um, anyone in the audience would like to make a comment um, or offer a question to both or either um, of the speakers. Yes, do we, do we have a mic? I'm curious if both of you could speak to how your evolving dialogues, intimacies that you have personally because you are inserting yourselves and your lives into your praxis or research or studying. And uh, it seems to me very generous that you've shared this publicly with us, but can you speak a little bit about how your um, interaction with other people along the way as you research and learn and praxis develops or evolves or changes it? Jean, you want to start? Okay. Um, um, from a pragmatic or, or from a just an observ observational point of view, you know, uh, there's uh, the, the, peop the artists and the art writers and the art administrators, the cultural coagulation in Canada is actually kind of small. Mm. So that means we do have an opportunity to actually know each other on some level trustingly, uh, like in a gathering like this, because the unwritten rule is we, we're, uh, we've all got the same uh, passions or the same commitment somehow to the art sector and its people. Um, so I find it very easy um, and very illuminating to just assume I can hug and kiss anybody I want to, and that sparks a relationship over time, time, time. Mm. And if there's one thing I've learned about Canada, you guys are slow burners. <laughs> <laughs> It's wonderful. You can meet someone and five years later, after the initial hug, <laughs> there's a way in which you know each other and trust each other and it builds into conversation <laughs> and interaction from there over two decades. And I, I, so in terms of intimacy, it's not just intense immediacy, which mm. I adore, but can only happen in a flash sometimes. It's also the intimacy that uh, it, it incrementally uh, 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 it enlarges itself over time. Mm -hmm. And however, on a more practical level, there are people who I am totally intimate with and they have to bear listening to my personal problems. <laughs> <laughs> So a type of sustained engagement, I think, um, mm. is, is one of the things that I, I think both of you engage mm. with, um, that, that your relationship to artists and to audience and uh, community um, is somehow carries um, 
a type of ethics with it. Yeah, actually, that that um, bringing that word into the room is really um, helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and also, we were talking a little bit in our discussions yesterday about um, intimate structures and re relationality, I suppose, to, um, as, as that kind of comes up in um, aspects of practice. And I suppose one thing I've um, often been interested in are um, the scales of relation that you have either to uh, an artwork or a place um, and how, uh, I suppose, one's um, criticality kind of navigates those scales of relation, um, and also how um, the different practices one uses to engage with um, people in places, if it's conversation or if it's um, travel or these kind of things, allows for these different kind of scales of relation. Um, and, and just to, because um, I, I think this is a really important question particularly for me at the moment, um, in this shift from um, earlier work writing in relation to artworks, then myself and James working collaboratively in um, a lot of different locations where we weren't really kind of involved in the, in the, in the local community or the politics or even that wasn't part of the question. Um, and so there was this whole um, body, I suppose, of, of, of work and practice where it's kind of the two of us kind of floating around and, and doing our thing, but not like in there. And then this body of work that's, um, it, it, we're not really in there. We're not. Um, I'm not an anthropologist. I'm not. You know. I mean, it's it's a strange relationship where I'm um, personally trying to kind of figure out the scale of relation to these different locations, and not that I I, I really don't think I'm getting it right often. But it's an open question. Um, so, for example, in this piece, um, I really really struggled um, to figure out what pronoun position to use um, because here's. Um, an environment that I didn't grow up in. I have a, um, a, a James is from uh, the Republic of Ireland. He has a little bit more of a relation. Um, and, uh, and, and then in that piece, in order to kind of, maybe it was a, a cop out, but um, to kind of think around it, bringing in the kind of, um, I don't think it's a cop out, but bringing in the, um, the, the wall, the entity of the wall, the, the things around the wall. So bringing in the non-human world was a way of kind of trying to think um, about a, a, a a, a different kind of we um, that, that isn't, um, and this is again part of a, um, another strand of thinking. I'm just going to ramble for a second because yeah, it's go. kind of crucial. It's kind of um, here and maybe it's an open question um, to all of us to kind of thinking about how we negotiate um, this pronoun position. And so the thing I was going to talk about today was going to refer to um, this amazing thinker I've been reading lately, um, Sylvia Winter, and she moves into um, trying to think about what do aesthetics do? And partly, part of that is trying to um, basically rethink um, being human as a practice. It's, it's, mm -hmm. She's fast, she goes far, mm -hmm. so I can't gloss it in two seconds. But um, it does come up, like, and, and some of my pondering lately has been coming up with trying to think of not a hegemonic we, like a collective we, not, um, um, you know, maybe not just the singular I and not a kind of de-individualized one, you know, that there's something that is in the possibility of of, of working with um, a we, first time I've ever worked with mm -hmm. it, um, that opens up possibilities, but without um, um, silencing and without speaking on behalf of, you know, it's, it's, it, it, these are these are situations that if anybody here is, is a writer will under possibly understand is like how to navigate um, these subjective positions in relation to the work and so having done a lot of work with I and, and you this is a kind of new thinking about a we and it's um, difficult <laughs> yeah. um, and it has to do a bit with intimacies and distances and, and politics um, right. in relation to that and yeah. structures yeah. and structures yeah um, I don't know if there's one really quick question left. It's time for us to wrap up. Is there? Yes, please. It's actually not a question, but just uh -huh. uh, relaying a message from Maria Fusco. Um, there's a sign-up sheet out there for her new book, Give Up Art. But uh, next to the sign-up sheet, there's little badges that say Give Up Art. They're free. There should be one for everyone. Please grab one. And she asked that you send her a photo, excuse me, a photo, if you can, of it uh, via Twitter to at Fusco Writing. Great. And, and thank you for, for um, mentioning Maria Fusco because um, one of the things that I have that I'm going to hand out um, just as we're ready to go off the stage is um, she developed, co-authored uh, 11 sort of steps, ideas on art writing uh, when she was the director of the program at Goldsmiths. And so I have 50 copies, and I thought some of you might be interested in it. Um, and so I'm just going to throw those out into the audience. Um, so 
It looks <laughs> like um, if we're going to try and help the organizers stay on time today, that we should thank you very much for thank your you. attentiveness and thank the panelists very much for their contributions. <laughs> And I just wanted to make one comment about this, this question about the intimacy, um, because I think there's so much within it. And um, I think it's, it, it, it asks us uh, something about the type of conversations that we generate and mm. participate in, and that maybe we find satisfying. And um, it, it does come back to this idea of sustained engagement, which mm. yesterday, as mm. we were having a conversation, we, we talked about slow time. You know, there's slow food movement, and there's slow academic movements now. And, and just the idea of slowing things down um, to be able to afford to have this sustained engagement. And one of the things we speculated on is, is this becoming a bit of a luxury mm -hmm. um, in an art economy that doesn't support um, the time required mm -hmm. sometimes to reach the potential of the kinds of commitments we want to make? Mm. So, Excellent. all right. Yeah. Yeah. Now Thank I'm going to throw out the sheets. Thank <laughs> you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank John Borsa, Chris Kreider, Maria Fusco, and Dr. Jean Randolph. A big hand, warm hand of applause, and then some housekeeping notes. Um, uh, for people, uh, we're directing you to the brunch launch at the gallery. There's also the, ca the camper subtext. Lunch is provided for the p panelists and performers, and others can use your 10% discount cards for Cafe Rosso or Phil and Sebastian's, and make sure these should be in your packages. Light refreshments, coffee and tea will be served at the gallery, and let's try to make our way back here for around 2 p.m. for modes of publishing and distribution, which will be the, um, the last presentation prior to the wrap-up. So thank you very much, and bon appétit.